Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar on building the case to drive change. We're giving everybody just a couple more minutes to join. Hey, John, how's it going? Fantastic, Greg, and how are you doing? I'm good. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So um, I'm going to start by introducing myself, John, and then I'm going to I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself. Um, so my name is Reagan Stafford Taran, and just to give you a little bit of background about me, I actually started my career in IT and pro project and program management. Um, and in this role, I was responsible for organizational uh, change management across our entire enterprise, uh, which included creating and distributing employee communications. Uh, and based on that experience in doing employee communications, I was asked to join my company's internal communications team, and I spearheaded a project to change our intranet. Um, it was not my first project around uh, changing out an intranet, but uh, maybe it'll be my last. Um, so I'm here today because I'm super passionate about people, specifically employees um, and employee engagement, and I'm super passionate about technology. Um, and those two things are really what brought me to Circle as an enterprise account executive. So today I'm gonna be sharing what I've learned uh, from my time as an internal communicator and from the hundreds of conversations I've had with internal communicators across the country. Uh, so today I'm joined by John. John, thank you so much for being here with me today and co-hosting this webinar. Uh, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Reagan. I'm honored to co-host with you. And yes, uh, I work at St. Louis Children's Hospital, have been here for 23 years. Uh, we have seen patients from all 50 states and 80 countries, and we have 3,500 employees. Um, so we are part of BJC Healthcare, which has 30,000 employees. It's St. Louis's largest employer locally, and we have about 15 hospitals. I work on a communications and marketing team. Uh, what's unique about me is first, I am the only male in the office, uh, <laughs> and then secondly, I also have a unique role on that team because we have uh, 10 or 12 people and most of them focus on external things in relation to communications marketing while I focus on employee communication internally. Um, what's unique about uh, what I have done here is we have rolled out at Children's Hospital four or five different platforms and we've served as an innovation lab of sorts. And once we pilot these things, they have been rolled out system-wide. So that has included digital signage, uh, an employee social network, HTML email, uh, now personalization, and also the, the uh, idea really for one platform serving as a project request project management system <laughs> which our system level people eventually chose the, the exact platform we're using now, but that's been a big success uh, the past year or so as well. Perfect. I'm super excited to, to have you today um, to help talk through how you've been able to gain support within your organization around um, tools that help support your, your internal communications work. So when, um, let me see if I can't change the slide. So, um, there, there are a lot of internal communications pains out there, and any internal communicator who's had a chance to chat with colleagues from other organizations knows that there are just a couple of universal truths for all internal comms professionals. Um, I think limited budgets is one that comes up fairly frequently, and John, I'm sure you can agree with that, um, particularly when we compare our budgets to our communication colleagues in other departments. I'm looking at you, Marcom. So we, uh, we don't typically get the same amount of budget to, to communicate and engage with our employees um, as, as our communicators that are working you know, with customers or prospective customers. So that's one of our universal truths uh, and, a, and a battle that we have to fight when we're looking at um, getting tools approved, right? Go ahead. Right, and on that, that point, Reagan, thank you. Uh, I will say that you may wonder why all these platforms and, and when we talk about internal comms, there's really two key um, skill sets. One is as old as uh, people living in caves and that's storytelling. 
Right. And another is to bring about the technology that will uh, result in those stories having the most impact, not just verbally, but visually. And we need better technology to do that. And, and this really all started back around 2010 when I was, I was probably working harder than I ever did in my career. But the problem was the only tool we had digitally was an intranet that, that I must say was antiquated, didn't work well. And to just take one step, let's, let's say for example, to embed a video would take literally at least a dozen steps. Mm -hmm. And it was time consuming and the impact just wasn't there. Right. Um, and so it was a lot of work, but with little result and really no real analytics that uh, were understandable anyway. Right. And so uh, that's at that point in time uh, where what evolved was kind of an effort to make our employee experience with their communication. Uh, we wanted to match as much as possible their experience at home with better technology. And that's why it's so critical that, that we moved ahead in, in bringing about better tools. Right. And I know that with limited budgets, that's a, that's a big hurdle because external communications and marketing typically gets the lion's share of the budgets. But we can use that uh, kind of like uh, in judo, you use that, use that weakness as a strength by saying, hey, we're spending all this money on external efforts and, and we know that our success in the marketplace starts with our success here in the workplace. So we need to spend a certain amount on internal communication and really um, focus on, on doing that. Right, absolutely. And that transitions so well, you know, you talked about, um, you know, the using tools that, that are antiquated and old, um, you know, that's another really common complaint that we have is that as internal communicators, we either get hand-me-downs from other departments where we're trying to use bastardized marketing tools that are really built for communicating with customers or prospective customers, not for communicating with employees, or we're dealing with aged and unsupported tools. I know in my, in my career, every internet that was set up was one of those things where like IT sets it up and then they walk away. And as internal communicators, you're left to try to make sure that you've got appropriate training, that, that, that it's getting updated, that old information isn't left out there forever and ever. So it's really hard when you're dealing with these aged and unsupported tools. Um, and I know in my experience, we also use some free online tools because it's what fit in our budget, right? And, um, and it's just not ideal uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with tools that aren't built for us, right, John? Exactly, and I think the number one most important question to ask when, when we're moving from an environment where we have the wrong tools to one where we hopefully have the right tools, the most important question is how does this technology help us meet our business needs? Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if you're looking at an internal communication email uh, platform, uh, one case you can make is, you know, if we enable comments on everything and people can comment, that's going to bring about a more honest and open culture of communication. And I think, especially with uh, the younger executives who are coming in, they know full well the critical aspect of performance. And we have tons of data on engagement and how that ultimately helps revenue, especially if we look at the Gallup information, for example. So there is plenty of evidence out there. I think um, in addition to that most important question, as far as you know, how does this help, help us meet our business needs? Another important component of this is what's called MOSCO. And I, I credit uh, social media for the large enterprise, also known as Smile, which is based in the, in the UK. Um, and this is important to, to type or write down. And Moscow is uh, an acronym that stands for must, should, could, won't have, and I believe that's it, yes. And so what this means, it, it allows you to prioritize the functions that are most important for what you're trying to achieve. So for example, when we're talking about uh, must have, uh, personalization would be a must have, for example. Mm -hmm. And then another must have might be mobility 
And as you go down the list and you have uh, could have or should have, uh, you know, group collaboration, for example, could be a, a could have. So right. it, it helps you prioritize in that conversation with IT because I, obviously we all need to interface with IT. They're the ones who kind of know the future roadmap of all of our systems in order to get, get things moving along. Right, right, absolutely. The other universal truth that, that we run into is that sometimes it's just not real clear how to navigate your company to get sign off on a new tool or initiative. Um, and I think that's that's part of what you're going to help us with today, John, is is talking us through, you know, how to build that case, right? Right. And I think another critical question is how will this make life easier, not only for employees but the communicators? If there's right. uh, a, a group of communicators in the organization, how will it make life easier for for both of these uh, constituencies? How will it save time? And as we know, time equals money. So these are the critical questions to be asking. Asking all the right questions is, is what's most important from the beginning as far as our experience has been concerned. Yep, absolutely. So you know, today we're gonna talk through kind of the steps that, that you follow when St. Louis Children's is looking to adopt new processes and tools. Um, so you know, normally the first step in building the case is around um, an intro and executive summary. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about um, about your experience in this and, and why you create an introduction and an executive summary. Okay, I'm going to step back a little bit before we touch on the executive summary because there's some context that I think is really important here. Perfect. And that's based, again, this is, my way isn't the only way, but it's been uh, successful so far. And I think uh, one of the most important things is when when you do your research, and you talk with others who have used a certain tool and you've talked with the vendor and you wanna partner with the vendor um, and you take all that knowledge, oftentimes we really want to write up a proposal right away and get it to senior leaders. And I think that's, that's moving a little too fast. Right. I think in, in terms of experience, what's been helpful is instead of the hard sell, in, during small talk, just kind of a by the way type uh, referral, talk with someone who's respected in your organization, especially someone outside your department who really knows the business well and, and talk about something else, maybe something about their kids or something. And then just secondarily raise the issue, oh, by the way, um, have just heard about this software and this is how it would help us. What do you think? And I think in having those conversations, it helps shape the compelling argument or executive summary as far as you know why this is useful, why we need it here, how it's gonna help people. And it also helps in having that conversation because they may throw up some uh, concerns that you hadn't thought about and that that has happened in, in my case as well. And it helps to, sh again, shape the more formal uh, type of, uh, of write-up. And it also is good to ask them for their advice as far as, you know, I, I want to move this ahead. How's the best way to do this in the organization? And another thing, I, there was one question that someone had sent in about, well, my boss won't listen to me or my boss always says no. So it's critical to have some allies or to find some allies or to find a champion outside of your department in showing them what this is all about and getting them on board in terms of the case for change because it's gonna be a lot tougher for your boss to say no to all these people who are part of the organization versus just you alone solitary. solitary. Um, those would be, and the other thing I think is when, when I first a few years ago brought about the possibility of an internal platform for HTML email, the very first answer was no. And it came from our marketing VP because from the marketing side of communications marketing, they had just chosen a new CRM platform that many hospitals were a part of and they weren't about to adopt something new. So I had to go back and really write up, say my top five benefits that are unique for this platform and how it would help in terms of internal communication. Right, 
Right. So I think that that you you hit the nail on the head with like going out and talking to people. I know, you know, when I was in internal comms and when I was in project management, that's how you find champions, right? And your champions are going to help identify blind spots that maybe you don't have and additional benefits. So I think that that's a really great, helpful tip in getting started. Um, you know, when we look at an introduction and executive summary, once you get to the point of writing a proposal, it really helps to provide context on how this new tool or this new process is going to affect your work and your company's work. Um, you know, I know from my experience, business cases aren't super prevalent in internal comms right now, but they really help to make the case. And, um, and, and the importance behind that is that our peers in other departments are doing this. They're making business cases. I promise you finances. Uh, it's very likely that marketing is and, and other departments across your organization. So when you're creating the summary, right, when you're creating the summary for your business case, it's really important that you highlight the elements that are strategic, that are data driven, and that are appropriate for your organization. Is there anything else you'd add to that, John? Oh, I think that's summarized uh, very well. Just the top three to five benefits. I mean, I had a hospital president uh, a couple months ago telling me about the time he received a proposal on his desk that was 60 pages long. And he said, I, I understand why that department needs all that information, but don't give me all that information. You know, make it digestible, make it the top three to five things. I don't have time. So the leaders are just like us. They're bombarded, they're underwater, and they just want something quickly where it's like, okay, this is how it's gonna make life easier or make life better or, or help our business case. Um, and really, uh, what, the good thing in our organization right now is at the BJC or a corporate level, the corporate umbrella, uh, right now there's a huge emphasis now on making things more customer centric and, and by that same token, more employee centric. So in thinking along those lines, that's a good uh, kind of template in your mind to be thinking, how, how does it do that uh, when we're looking at a platform? Right, and that brings me to the next point, so that's perfect. So you know, next, we're gonna wanna show how the new tool or process is gonna work, right? right. So what I found super helpful is to gear our demonstrations to the audience. So I highly recommend partnering with your salesperson. If you're looking at a new piece of software, partner with them and help them understand who the audience is going to be in the room. Um, because if we're meeting with practitioners, right, they're gonna want that nitty gritty. They're gonna wanna see what the day in the life is gonna feel like. And they're gonna wanna know how this is gonna help them move their internal comm strategy forward. But if you're meeting with executive leadership, they're going to want to know how is this going to help the whole company and why do we need to do this and what happens if we don't do this. Um, and, and I really, I, I encourage you guys to lean on, on your salesperson that you're working uh, with if you're looking at a new piece of technology because they can help uh, guide through this process internally and tailor down those demos to fit the, the correct audience. What do you think, John? How, how do you show how it works? Well, that's great advice, Reagan, because uh, first and foremost, uh, when we're talking about any platform, I want to know the, the website of, of the platform. And I'm talking, for example, for Circle, I would want to research your website as much as possible because there are white papers that are, that are going to aid in the case for change. There's ROI calculators, et cetera. So there's a lot just on a vendor's website. Uh, where you can learn a lot more about the product and about just the benefits of that kind of platform. Um, I, also, when we're talking about um, not just showing how it works, but the benefits, I think it's important to really imagine life with this new platform. So when we're talking about the executive summary, we want to talk about, hey, imagine if we can do this. Imagine if we can do that. Wouldn't it be great if we could do this? And that's a good real life way to, to sell it. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, when we look at benefits, um, you know, and, and how, do we, how do we figure out the anticipated result? How do you do that? Well, when you're looking at benefits, it's really important to start with those business outcomes that you want to achieve, right? And then how do those business outcomes, how do those tie 
to your entire organization's strategic goals and objectives? Who's going to be impacted by this change and how? Is there going to be a long-term cost savings? Is there process improvement? Uh, does this tool allow for automation, which equates to less human error? So it's really important to lay out those benefits, right? Is the new tool or technology going to limit IT burden going forward? So let, let's go back, going back to my intranet um, uh, example, right? So if you've got an IT department that's going to set it and forget it, and then you're on your own, well, there's, there's still a burden there, right, that, that you need to measure. So is this going to be a tool that's going to eliminate that IT burden? Um, does the tool provide time savings? And does this time savings give you availability to work on other projects? I have a current customer, just to use an example, who was able to take the six hours a week that she saves by using Circle to conduct a full comms touch point assessment. And then they did their, they redid their entire website based on the data that they found, right? So they were able to utilize that time savings and put it towards a different project. And then I highly recommend that folks look at the less tangible benefits as well. So how is this tool going to improve employee engagement? Um, you know, we said earlier that engaged employees are, are valuable, right? They're super valuable. They actually impact the bottom line. And, you know, I think that one of the things that we, that we can look at once we get our employees engaged, now we can turn them into brand ambassadors. And having your employees be brand ambassadors for you is, hugely, hugely valuable. I mean, that's, that's free marketing, right? Can't get much better than that. So following, following this webinar, I'm going to be sharing some additional content. Um, you know, I, again, I encourage you guys to work with your salesperson um, if you're looking at a new piece of, of technology, um, because they should be able to help you outline those benefits. And John, to your point, going to the website is another great way to find information. But I'm going to provide a sample benefit stock um, I also have an article around how to best work with IT. Um, and then I've got a link to some review sites so that you can tap into your peers who have, who have reviewed uh, various tools. Do you have anything that you would add around the anticipated results, John? Yes, because this is critical. In order to lay out the future, we need to understand and comprehend the anticipated results, obviously. So right. definitely call and email existing users of the product, ask the vendor for referrals, or find out on LinkedIn who's using the product. Um, talk about their challenges as well as their successes so that you have a really good uh, neutral um, take on, on what the benefits uh, are in terms of the uh, platform. Uh, scour the examples on the vendor website, the vendor's blog. Uh, do some internet searches, not just in terms of web references, but also news articles about the vendor. And I also think it's really important to look at independent reviews on sites like the G2 Crowd and Captera, um, and for the int intranet, Nielsen Norman Group and Social Media for the Large Enterprise and Step 2 out of Australia. Um, I also think that once, that once we're on a platform, it's Im important to continuously improve and really convey that in, in your rationale as well. So for example, if, if you have an intranet, maybe entering it in the Worldwide Intranet Challenge, looking at vendor benchmarks, which I know Circle has vendor benchmarks, so you can compare what your, for example, your open and click-through rates look like in terms of uh, other benchmarks like your industry benchmark, uh, even entering what you've done in awards, uh, analyzing your analytics. Um, there are all sorts of steps that can be taken to ensure that we're continuously improving all the time because that's probably one of the most critical aspects of what we do. Um, in addition, um, I'm going to skip back. I, I, did we have an industry trend slide or did I overlook that one? No, we don't. Well, no, we do. It's coming up. It's a couple slides. It's up. coming up. Okay. So I thought that was back. Okay. So now I'm in sync. Thank you, Reagan. I'm a little uncoordinated. It's okay. I've I've got you handled. Thank you. So the next uh the next thing that, that we wanted to talk about was costs, right? So um, you know, unfortunately, change usually costs money, and especially if you're looking at, at bringing in a new tool. So you have to sell that too internally. Um, and I've got some tips for you on, on how to bring down the cost um, that I wanted to share. So, 
you know, number one, again, I'm going to say partner with your salesperson. They're on your team. <laughs> Use them and talk to them about what you have available from a budgetary standpoint so that they can help you realize the benefits within your budget. Um, and most, most software companies are going to be willing to work with you on pricing, right? There's room for negotiation. Um, some other things that you can do is you can look at doing a pilot instead of rolling out to the entire organization. Um, and this comes from my project management days. So if you do a pilot, you're going to get lessons learned there. You're going to learn things about the rollout. You're going you're gonna to see some maybe where you wasted time that you can speed that up and, and use those efficiencies. So pilots are a really great way um, to, to cut the cost because you can learn all your lessons um, with a small group and then have a much more streamlined rollout when it's or going org-wide. You can also negotiate with your, your software partner around getting training for free, right? Or maybe reducing the cost um, by being willing to be a reference or uh, being willing to participate in a case study, right? Um, which helps you know, your, your software vendor from a, uh, from a marketing perspective. Um, from an internal perspective, one of the things that I found valuable um, when I was in internal comms was are there other uh, departments that are going to benefit? And this goes back to like laying that groundwork really early, John, by going out and talking to people in different departments and getting their feedback. Um, but you can also see if this, is this, if this is a tool that they're going to find value in too, maybe they would be able to put some of the money in from their budget as well to help offset the cost to your internal comms team. Right, so that's another way to offset the cost a little bit, but also getting those key people across the different departments um, helps with just gaining buy-in and helping you get through that internal approval process. Um, so I've got a great article that I'm gonna share again after the webinar around navigating the internal waters with this. You know, John, what, what, what do you have to add around covering the costs here? I wanna second what you said about the partnering with the vendor, that's critical, especially when it comes to ROI. And I'm not a math guy, you know, so. <laughs> Uh, I will freely admit that. So I, I get a lot of assistance from the vendor and kind of uh, expect that of a vendor. Um, in addition, uh, when we're talking about a pilot, I think it's critical to also uh, set expectations and also educate uh, the people in your organization about the software and the benefits, et cetera. Because I'll give you an example. When we uh, we're going to move forward with HTML email. There were a lot of misunderstandings where they thought it worked just like a website. And while there are some similarities, there are also some, some key differences. Mm -hmm. And so that was one example. And, and I think it's also critical to go into it with a certain mindset. And, and often I think in life, fear drives us. Right. Uh, we don't want to do something out of fear. We want to stick with our routine out of fear. And when it comes to technology, fear really has no place. Right. We have to be ready to fail in order to ultimately succeed. We may lose a battle, but win the war. Right. And so I think it's really important to have that kind of mindset going into it and, and really set expectations with everyone that, hey, we could fail. This may not be. That's why we do a pilot. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So you mentioned ROI, you know, for, for me, I think ROI is just, it's, it's pretty important. Um, and I mentioned it earlier, it's time for internal comms to show up to the table in a very strategic way. Um, and that really requires understanding the return on your investment. That allows you to be strategic and not tactical. So John, you know, when, when you wow with ROI, <laughs> bit about how you wow with, with ROI? Uh, well, I just think that um, it's important to show some kind of tangible, excuse me, tangible benefit in terms of time, because time is money. And so when, when we're talking about time being money, like I mentioned, many vendors on their sites have an ROI calculator. And, and sometimes that calculator is not enough. Sometimes you really need to talk it through with the vendor. So for example, there was a time when uh, the vendor came back with an ROI that really represented everyone in the organization. And I said, well, we don't have everyone in the organization engaging with our communication. 
our open rate, for example, may be 80% or 70%. So let's base our formula on that percentage so that it's more realistic. And I think that's important because often, uh, you know, from the vendor side, they, they understandably want to make things as impressive as possible, but we Im impressive may not be wholly realistic. So it's up to the communicator to really bring in the context of, of what happens in the organization to make that ROI uh, come out even better. But when we're talking about time, let's, let's take again, some kind of HTML email platform. Um, if it's something like Circle, for example, um, it's going to be recommending more relevant content up front. So that means instead of being bombarded with all sorts of one size fits all information that they, the employee may or may not be interested in, based on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, right. really what's happening is each piece of content that that person clicks on, the keywords in that content are going to be tracked so that in, in future content recommendations, they will be receiving content recommendations that are, are closer to their interests or their role. And so our president of our hospital will be getting slightly different content recommendations than say our nursing, chief nursing executive because they have different roles and different interests and they click on different things. Right. And so from a time perspective, that will reduce the amount of time uh, that they would be uh, looking for the information they need. Now, there's going to have to be some kind of ballpark estimate on that. It won't be exact, but it's better than nothing. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have an ROI uh, calculator um, on our website. Um, I can include that in the, uh, the follow-up if anybody wants to check that out um, and see how Circle has, has ours. Um, I would like to move along and talk a little bit. Oops, I skipped too far ahead. <laughs> um, Oh, I lost, I lost the industry trend slide. So we can talk about industry trends anyway, if that's okay. Right, let's talk a little bit about industry trends. So we, you know, at, at Circle, we like to tie to industry trends in general. And I feel like industry trends are important for a number of reasons. So um, they help to tell the story, right? So at Circle, you know, if I, if I use Circle as an example, you know, we use um, artificial intelligence and automation to create a personalized experience. Well, how does that tie to an industry trend? How does, how does that tie to anything? Well, early on in our conversation, John, you had mentioned that there is this expectation um, that we are using consumer grade experiences or we're creating consumer grade experiences for our employees. And, and as the millennials are in the workforce and as Gen Z is starting to enter the workforce, that expectation is not going to go away, right? That expectation is going to continue. So when we look at Circle, that sentence that I had about AI and personalization and automation, that's a lot of buzzwords. So we like to use Netflix as an example where, you know, John, if you and I were both to log in, into Netflix, we would have different content surfaced to us. And that's because of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So Netflix learns about you based on the TV shows and the movies that you watch and then surfaces up content like that. Well, that's exactly what Circle does for internal comms, right? But we use that analogy to help people understand what we're talking about and what we do. When it's something that's so outside of what business as usual looks like, it's really important to tie to industry trends and to tell stories around it, create an analogy that makes it easy to understand. What do you think, John? I agree, Reagan, and I, I'm a little more familiar with just Amazon because when we're talking about an organization, I think a lot of organizations are realizing now that if we think like people in our industry, we're probably not going to be successful. We have to think like Amazon right. because Amazon has it down. Convenience, speed, people can do it remotely. They are continuously improving the offering so that there's nice surprises instead of bad surprises. Right. Um, and they have the AI thing down, obviously, because as soon as you buy a product, they have all these recommendations for what can go with it, right? Reagan, you shop Amazon all the time. I there. do, I do. I'm, I'm such a sucker for Amazon. I can't help it. <laughs> so, I, you know, so really, when we're talking about a hospital or a healthcare system, we have to think like that too, because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And the old model for hospitals and healthcare systems 
won't necessarily be successful tomorrow. So when we're talking about employee communication, uh, the same thing holds true. We have to constantly be on the edge of technology and looking for better and better uh, options. And so uh, right now, if, if we look at all the ex expertise out there, especially on LinkedIn, the thought leaders and even the vendors, they're all talking about the importance of personalization instead right. of the what one size fits all type of approach that has, has, has historically been presented. And so that's a, a, a critical component of employee communication right now. People want more relevant content recommendations instead of being bombarded with communication that, that Noise. It's not relevant to them. And, and consequently, there are more and more people, and I, I would argue younger and younger people who just turn off completely because they don't want to be bombarded. They don't have time. And we see this with our enterprise social network where if anyone has technical issues, the standard response has been, oh, they can call the IT help desk. Well, you know what? They're so busy in, in, in nursing areas, they don't have time to call the help desk. If it's not going to work the first time, then it just doesn't work for them, period. And I don't blame them. They, they aren't going to mess with that. Our job is to give them technology that works and that works just as well as the technology that they use at home. And in internal communications, we have the opportunity to lead the way in our organizations in being future focused and continuously improving what we do. Perfect. So let's, uh, let's move on um, and, and start wrapping up. I've got some questions from the audience. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box um, and we will we'll get started on that. So um, John, one of the questions that came in was, how long should an executive summary be? I want to make sure that it provides enough context, but I'm afraid that my boss won't read it if it's too long. Um, what's your take on that? That's a very good concern about uh, being afraid that the boss won't read it because it's too long. That's that's definitely true because the boss uh, is is underwater just like we are. Right. And so I I would say that uh, in terms of the size of this component, keep it to 100 words or fewer. You know, two or three paragraphs. Uh, that executive summary should be a summary rather than uh, details. And so um, I, as far as um, I, I think, uh, so she was just asking about the executive summary, nothing else? Nothing okay. else. Well, so another question that came in though, that's kind of tied to the proposal is, you know, would screenshots be good for the show how it works section or is that overkill? I thought that was an excellent question and I kind of wished in my, in my summary, uh, the past few, uh, for the past few versions of software that I would have had screenshots, that's an excellent idea. And I would say it's, it, it's a great idea, visually especially, but I would, again, keep it to that magic three to five number. What are the most critical screenshots? Because otherwise, they'll, they'll be drowning in screenshot overload. Perfect. So another question that came in was, are companies usually willing to lower the cost if you go for a longer contract? So I'm, I'll take that one as, a, as the salesperson here on the, on the call. So absolutely, that's another really great way to bring down the cost of a new company. It's to negotiate with, uh, with, with the, the vendor that you're talking to on reducing the price for a longer contract. So that's a great way um, to, to reduce the, the cost. Um, so another question that came in was um, the point on uh, the hand-me-down tools. It really hit home. Do you have any suggestions for demonstrating to leadership that our hand-me-down tools from our friends in marketing don't work for internal comms? Do you have any examples for us, John? Yes. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there was the example of um, the external marketing focused HTML email platform and I was wanting to bring in an internal communication platform and we even had a, a different department um, that was using a, a different external platform at the time so um, what I was showing was basically the fact that you don't have to know HTML and there are all these, I would show them what the capabilities are and I would limit it to my top three to five right. and differentiate, okay, this is how it's going to give us an advantage versus an external platform. And, you know, there are many uh, internal options 
Um, and the reason there aren't many is because they work, they do a good job, and they, they reveal much more data and analytics than an external platform otherwise would. So I would say to summarize, first, gather the communication capabilities from vendors and from people who use the software. Um, and another thing that I think is also important is, especially in the pilot phase, to be with real people in your organization at their elbow, doing some user experience, firsthand observation, maybe some interviewing on how it's going with them using the product maybe even do a short survey on satisfaction and, and what their experience was like and, and asking them to comment uh, if necessary, if you need to drill down further on, on some aspect of it, having not a focus group, but just an informal talk with maybe a group of five people from a department that's using the platform. Right. Um, or even in, in terms of building your case, let's say we have a horrible intranet we want to observe people using that. We want to give them a list of search, things to search for. We want to interview them on what that was like. We want to interview them and observe them on, on what the pitfalls are so that we can build the case of, hey, we've got something that needs to be fixed here. How are we going to do that? And really, as internal communicators, we can come up with that. And so now the key is, how is the communication personalized for every employee? If it's not, there's a, an opportunity there for the internal communicator to really rise up and, and show how we can do that. Right, absolutely. So I think the last question, we just have time for, for one more. We've got one more minute left before, uh, before we're closing out. I have trouble even getting on the radar of my boss. Any tips? So do you have any tips, John? Yes, uh, first it's important to have allies and if you don't have allies outside your department to start looking for them and, and building those relationships. Um, so like I said earlier, when you build support and you talk to people in other departments and look at their business needs and the kind of information they need and how they access that information or what, what their barriers are right now, that's a lot of credibility because that is going to really capture the attention of senior leadership much more so than, oh, John, the communicator thinks this is great. Right. And so if you have people from throughout the organization uh, talking about their pain points, talking about what they need, and then this is how this fills the bill, that is going to be um, a much more captivating um, rationale. And again, avoiding the hard sell, talking about it informally so you can gradually shape your case. Right. How will this make life easier for staff? Exactly, exactly. Well, you know what? I think that's it. We're at the end of our time. John, thank you so very much for joining me today. It has been a pleasure as always uh, to talk with you. And thanks everybody else for joining and, and, uh, and participating in our webinar. So I really appreciate everybody's time. Thanks, everyone. It's been a joy, and thank you, Reagan. Thanks. Bye-bye.